I have a question for y'all. Who likes dinosaurs? Clap your hands if you like dinosaurs. Well, you're in luck because you happen to be at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and guess what we have a lot of? Dinosaurs, exactly. Welcome to the museum, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Planet Theater. My name is Chris Smith. I'm curator for the Daily Planet Theater. My job here at the museum is to welcome all of you to our fun and special events here at the museum. I am so excited to see so many people here in the museum today to see what we've got in store. Right here is something very special going on. And you're going to learn about it, learn all about it, in just a short moment. Thank you all for coming out. This is so exciting. Do this for me. Who is ready to meet a paleontologist? Show of hands. Anybody here want to be a paleontologist when you become adult-sized? I won't say grown up because that hasn't happened to me yet. Who wants to be paleontologist? Show of hands. You think you want to study ancient history, dinosaurs, creatures that no longer walk the earth but maybe did once before? Well, the museum's expert in paleontology, someone who knows a lot about dinosaurs, is the head of paleontology here at the museum, Lindsay Zano. She's with us here at the museum, and she also works at North Carolina State University. I want you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Dr. Lindsay Zano. Thank you, Chris. Thanks everybody for coming out today. We are so excited that you are here. We at the Paleontology Unit at the museum are out every summer on expedition making cool discoveries. But I have to tell you that this is one of our absolute favorite things we have ever found. And we are just buzzing with excitement up in the lab. And I think you will be too when we finally reveal it. To tell you about what we're going to see today, we're all going to have to get in a time machine and travel back in time 97 million years before today to Utah, to a time when North America looked very, very different than it does today. This was a time when global temperatures were really high. The planet was really hot, and there was no ice at the North or South Pole. And because of that, all the water from those ice caps was in the oceans, and sea level was really high. So a lot of places were underwater at this time. This is North Carolina. You can see half of North Carolina was underneath the Atlantic 97 million years ago. But this fossil right here wasn't found in North Carolina. It was found in a place called Utah, which is one of the places that we go out every summer on expedition searching for dinosaurs. You can see that Utah actually looked a lot like North Carolina does, right? It's on the coast of a very large body of water. And this was called the Inland Sea, the Western Interior Sea. The water had come in from Canada and flooded down over North America. Because of that, this area in Utah was actually a coastal environment. It was a delta plain where large rivers were emptying out into the ocean. It was a very lush place, teeming with plants and animals, all kinds of dinosaurs, but also all kinds of other animals like turtles and crocodiles, sharks and lizards and snakes, and even early mammals and pterosaurs were living here at the time. Now, when we go out to Utah to search for dinosaurs, it doesn't look like this. It looks like a dry desert, which is what you would see if you went out to Utah today. And you can see the area that we go is really challenging to get around in. There's a lot of cliffs and a lot of um, rocky places. And so for the past six years, we've actually been hiking all over this landscape, surveying every square meter looking for new species of dinosaurs and trying to get up on top of these cliffs. 
And that's a really big challenge. Sometimes we've come flat up against cliffs we couldn't climb, so we've been sort of probing around in some really tough terrain, trying to get into these places where we thought we might have spectacular discoveries like this. Now, all that work has been for good reason. We found already over five new species of dinosaurs in this area, representing a whole ecosystem that's been unknown to scientists and to the public. We've only named one of those dinosaurs, so stay tuned. We have four new dinosaurs that we're working on describing and naming from this area. And all those discoveries are helping us piece together a picture of what it looked like if you were to travel back in time and go to Utah 97 million years ago, it might look something like this, with giant carnivores and, and big plant-eating dinosaurs and even small feathered raptor-type dinosaurs. This discovery, though, that we have hiding under here, it's not a new dinosaur. I'm sorry to disappoint you if that's what you came for. It's something even more rare. It's a site we call Deep Eddy, and it was discovered in 2016, one member of our expedition team was out in those cliffs hiking around and it was the end of a very long hot day and when I say hot, the temperatures get about 120 degrees when we're hiking around up here. So he's hot, he's tired, it's almost time to turn around and go home. He's walking around the side of the hill and he sees a little knob of hill down below him. And he thinks to himself, I should just keep going, there's nothing down there. And then he thinks, you know, if I don't go down there and check that little knob of that hill, I'll wonder for the rest of my life if there was something really cool in that little hill. And so he works himself up and he goes and hikes down to the hill and he checks it and he comes around the corner and he sees something very special sticking out of the side of the hill. It's these thin little pieces of fossil with these bumpy textures all over them. And he recognizes that not only are these little pieces of eggshell, but the way they're coming out of the hill, it looks like there might be a whole perfect egg sitting inside the hill. Well, when we got a hold of this eggshell bits that this scientist who is on our team found, his name is Bucky Gates, we knew instantly from looking at those eggshells that this wasn't just a typical dinosaur egg. Even though dinosaur eggs are rare, almost all of them come from duckbills or raptor dinosaurs. We knew it came from a very special kind of dinosaur called an oviraptorosaur. And it kind of looks like an overgrown bird, right? It's got feathers, it's got feathers coming off its arms, it's got a beak, and sometimes even has a crest on top of its head. Now, oviraptor nests have been found before. We have hundreds of them from China and Mongolia, but only two eggs, partial eggs, fragmentary eggs, have ever been found here in North America, and they're not very well preserved. This is what an oviraptorosaur nest looked like. So we knew from looking at that little bit of egg that if we had a whole nest or even part of a nest, it would be the first time we found anything like that on the entire North American continent. Now, oviraptors are really cool because just like birds, they sat on their nests and kept them warm while the babies were developing inside the eggs. So we have some spectacular fossils of actual skeletons of these animals sitting on their nests waiting for their eggs to actually hatch. So the problem for us with this discovery, this deep eddy site that Dr. Gates found was where it was. We had kind of crazily been hunting in areas we knew were really inaccessible and really hard to get to. So when we found this, we knew the biggest challenge we would have is figuring out how to get it out of there safely. You can see that the site itself is sandwiched between a thousand foot cliff below and a thousand foot cliff above. This means when we returned to excavate the site the next year, we had to put together a very special team of half crazy people and half really excited people, including some of our most intrepid volunteers and staff and students who are willing to make the three mile each way hike through these cliffs, carrying in this case 350 pounds of gear to the site so that we could actually start the excavation. 
So if you wonder what a site looks like when it's found, it kind of looks like this. It's not much, right? But soon we began dig digging into this particular hillside and revealing that there were more and more eggs inside. And one of the biggest challenges for us when we were digging this up is the eggs are really thin and fragile, but the rock that they were in was incredibly hard. It was harder than concrete. So we had to be really careful to break that hard rock, but not break the fossils. So we had to use some pretty heavy duty tools to do that. So we kept chipping around the rock and the fossil being careful, trying to release it from the rock it was entombed in, and then putting paper and mud around it to stabilize it, and then finally putting plaster on top to protect the fossil. And then we had to dig trenches around it so we could get it out in one big block. While we were clearing all that rock away from the fossils, we found some pretty cool stuff at the site. This is our team geologist, and he's removing some plant material that we found lying, lining the bank just next to the dinosaur nest. So you can see he's chipping away that little plant material there to study. When we started sweeping off the surface near the nest, we also found something really cool, which is the remnants of ancient roots from ancient trees that were around the nest when this dinosaur was laying its eggs. So So finally, after we got around the nest, we had a beautiful nest of dinosaur eggs and one big problem. It weighed about 1,400 pounds. Typically, when we have a fossil, we try and make the jacket a um, manageable size. If it's under 300 pounds, we strap it to a stretcher, and we have the team carry it out by hand. But we knew with a jacket this size, 1,400 pounds, there was no way we were going to be able to get this fossil out by ourselves. So there was really only one thing to do. In the fall of last year, we went back, and this time we brought a helicopter. So we wrapped the fossil up in a helicopter net, and we used the helicopter to pick it up for us and fly it out of the cliffs about five miles to where we had a truck waiting that could receive the block and drive it back to the museum. It was a pretty spectacular thing to see. And here it is coming out of the cliffs. So we're still way up in there. We just watched the jacket fly away, but then we had to do the long hike to get out and meet the jacket on the other side. So you can see what it's like to be the helicopter pilot. He's trying to get that dinosaur fossil that's on the end of a really long rope into that tiny little truck waiting on the ground without hurting it or dropping it or banging it into the truck or breaking the fossil jacket open. So he just carefully lowers it into the truck bed for us. It is pretty amazing. And there it goes. So before I turn this over to a couple of very special people on the team, I just want to thank some of the people who helped make this happen. Because those of you who want to be a paleontologist, paleontology is a team sport. No one paleontologist can go out and do this work by themselves. So I want to thank uh, our expedition team member, Dr. Gates, who found the eggs. Our two crazy uh, trace fossil specialists who came out with us to help us dig up these fossils. Our team geologist, Dr. Tucker, and one of our graduate students, Haviv, who's here in the audience today, <laughs> for making the trek out with us. And then introduce you to two special team members who are here in the audience with us today. Where are they? Lisa? Herzog, who's uh, the person in charge of conservation of all of our fossils at the museum and who hiked out to the site with us. And Aaron Gitterman, who's our chief fossil preparator. He's the one who cleans all the fossils out of the rock without breaking them and who worked to clean these fossils for us to show you today. All right. Yep. Let's show you what we got.
here they are. So Aaron has been slowly revealing some of the eggs from the nest. So far, there's only two showing, but we know there are at least 10 or 12 more eggs inside here. And Aaron is going to clean the, the, the fossil and reveal all of the eggs. But why don't you come on up and have a look? Those of you that are up here close already. Watch yourself. So, Lindsay, can I ask you a few questions about the dinosaurs while we're looking? Sure thing. So, tell me again uh, the name of the dinosaur that laid these eggs. So, this is a nest of a dinosaur group called Ovaraptorosaurs. So, they're very similar to birds. They look a lot like birds, but they're kind of cousins to birds. They're not birds themselves. How big was an Ovaraptorosaur to have laid an egg, you know, sort of the size that we see here? So some oviraptorosaurs are very small and some are gigantic. The individual that laid these eggs is from a new species that we're working on that we estimate would have been about 15 feet tall. So picture a 15 foot tall chicken and then you get an egg about this size. <laughs> a 15 foot tall chicken. I can picture it. I can picture it. Picture it. And how many eggs are exposed now in the fossil? So right now we just have two eggs that Aaron has been cleaning in the lab, but we know that there are anywhere from 10 or more eggs in the nest that are still waiting to be revealed under the rock. So there's a lot more eggs than what we're seeing here on the top. It's just gonna take a lot of time to get through the whole thing. It is gonna take a lot of time. Aaron will use a small needle to clean basically every grain of rock away from the fossils over what will probably be at least a year. Over a year. That's incredible. But it's, I guess it's sort of painstaking work because you don't want to damage the fossils in any way and you want to make sure you can get as much scientific data from them as possible. That's right. We have to be really careful when we prepare these because there might be evidence of the structure of the nest or other things that can tell us more about uh, the reproductive capacity of these animals or the, there could be, um, it's unlikely, but there could be the baby dinosaur bones in there or some other things that we're not expecting to find either. So it's a very slow, careful process. So do me a favor, if you're right here in this section, take one step back. Thank you very much. So stay one step back from this side. That way the people on the second and third floors can see the cameras and not the backs of your heads. So what we're looking at right now, there's two eggs exposed in so far in this jacket. And I'm getting a lot of questions of how do we know there's more inside. Um, and the answer to that is because this is the bottom of the rock when it was when we collected it in the field the pictures that lindsay showed this rock was flipped over and we were looking at the other side 
and there were a lot of eggs exposed on that side that are now wrapped in plaster and burlap here that Aaron will be working on up in the, on the third floor lab if you want to check on our progress over the next few months. Um, we'll be exposing more of the eggs that are in here. We're not, so far we haven't discovered any skeletal material that there's any embryos or anything inside of the eggs, but that doesn't mean we won't find them. It's always a possibility until it's not. <laughs> we may end up having to CT scan, uh, you know, the specimen, but right now it's kind of big. CT scanners aren't. And Aaron? I saw yep. you in the lab over the last couple of days working on this. Uh, what's the work like, shipping uh, away at rocks? Yeah, so we have everything in a plaster cast. When we, we bring it back, step one is to kind of saw the lid off and just crack it open. After that, you just got to slowly but surely remove all the extra rock matrix, we call it, that you don't need, and just avoid shipping anything that we want to keep. So I just start out with uh, air scribes, hand tools, just start clearing out all the extra material, just being careful to leave the eggs and just emphasize this so it's understandable for the researchers to do their thing later on. And uh, yeah, come check it out sometime. And I understand this is gonna go back up to the third floor to the paleontology lab. People can look in through the windows and watch over the next several months as it gets worked on and prepared. Yep, yeah, this will be at least for the next few months. <laughs> Possibly for a, a very long time, depending on circumstances. Yeah, it's a, uh, definitely a very labor-intensive process, so we want to just make sure that all the data in here is preserved and that everything just you know, looks cool in the end. So, uh, Lisa or Lindsay, either one of you can take this question. What kinds of data? So, as Aaron's chipping away the rock and the eggs become more and more visible all throughout the entire specimen, what kinds of data are you taking? Are you measuring the width and length of an egg, their placement? What kinds of things do you learn? How, what's that process like, step by step? So we want to know a few things about the nest. For example, was it um, open to the air? Was it buried with sediment or buried with plant material? Most of these dinosaurs seem to have laid nests and just laid their eggs on the surface of the ground. Um, but we're keeping our eye out for any indication that this particular species, since this is a brand new discovery and has never been found before, might have done something different with its nest. So Aaron's keeping an eye out for any plant material or any sense of the original structure of what the nest shape might have looked like. Um, we'll take um, data on the eggs themselves, what position they're in, uh, what level of development they were, how big they are. Um, how big the pores are so we can tell if they were buried underground or if they were exposed to the air. And the goal is to learn more about the reproductive biology of this new species of dinosaur. That's fascinating stuff. I'm excited I get to see it every day. This is going to be fun. So uh, if you're out there in the audience, if you're here with us on the first floor or if you're up on the second floor and you have questions for Lindsay, Lisa, or Aaron about our brand new dinosaur egg discovery, you can raise your hand if you're down here with me on the first floor. I'll try to get a microphone to you. If you're on the second floor and you have a question, Miranda, who's waving the microphone, can get that to you. That way everyone can hear and we can get your questions. So if you're on the second floor, wave at her. If you're down here with me, I'm going to try to find you. Um, how long do you think these eggs were here? How long have they been at the museum or how long were they in the ground? I was thinking, how long have they been under the ground or in the ground? They were in the ground for about 97 million years. Whoa, I like that. <laughs> I like his face. Whoa. Um, was it previously known that this species of dinosaur was on North America? So this is actually one of our new species that we haven't named or described yet that laid these eggs. And so we're still working on the research to name that species. So it's presently unknown, the species that laid these. Have you figured out the dinosaur's lifespan yet? Uh, we have not figured out this particular dinosaur's lifespan. We can do some research on that because we have its leg bones, and if we cut into its leg bones, we can figure out how long it took to grow to full size. 
we do know that these types of dinosaurs laid their eggs before they were fully grown. So sometime around their teenage years, they started reproducing and laying eggs. So this is maybe not the egg of a full-grown member of this particular species. It might have been a smaller individual. Um, how did you put it in a helicopter net? Without That's a good question. Heavy. You know what we did? We rolled it. We chipped underneath it till it was just on a little bit of rock, and then we all got behind it and we pushed it and flipped it into the net, and then we put plaster on the other side so it was completely covered. Yeah, that was a lot of work watching the videos that the museum brought back. It took, what, six people? Five people just to flip it? It took, yeah, it took all of us to flip it. Yeah. Yeah. 1,400 pounds of rock and fossils. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have another question. Um, did you like cut into the rock or did like only one area have plaster on it? Okay, so this whole top was covered with plaster and Aaron went with a, a saw and he sawed it open and he took the top plaster top off. Everything you see kind of from here on this sort of back area is just as Lindsay saw it in the field. Pretty much the only part we've really altered so far is everything up front. It's a little bit darker, a little bit shinier just to reveal these two eggs so far. So this is all still a work in progress sort of on the back end. Oh, um, just wondering, how do you find out what dinosaurs ate? How do we find out what dinosaurs ate? Um, sometimes we study their teeth. Sometimes we have gut contents preserved. Um, sometimes we look at the mechanics of the jaw to figure out what they eat. So it's mostly in the mouth and how the mouth works and what shape the teeth are. I'm gonna do one more question from down here from somebody that hasn't asked one yet. Two more. What, what is that white stuff? Aaron, you take that one. What is <laughs> the, that white stuff? The white stuff is plaster. It's the same sort of material if you ever had a plaster cast for a broken bone. Um, it's just something that we use to protect the specimens in transport as we're uh, pulling them out of the ground and then driving them back to the museum. And then same thing if we need to make a support jacket for everything. If it's a very fragile specimen when it's done, this will just help keep it stabilized uh, just for future study. Okay, now the last question. Um, how, how long does it take to cut it open? This took most of Saturday. Uh, it, it all depends on the size and complexity of the jacket. So if there's a lot of bumps, it just takes a little bit longer. Uh, some projects we have can be done in an afternoon. Um, there's going to be more cutting, more removing a rock. This will take bare minimum a few months. We shall see. All right, Chris, I have one question up here. Question from the second floor. Where did you find it? We found this in Utah. Middle of the desert. All right, everybody. So I want to make sure that lots of people have the opportunity to come by and see. So if you've been up here in the front, thanks for visiting. You can head out that direction, my right, your left. That way, other folks who are in the museum can come up, take your spot, and get an opportunity to see this incredible discovery and meet our paleontologist. Yeah, let me just And thank you for visiting the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I'm so glad that everybody came out today to enjoy this incredible discovery. We're going to stick around for a few minutes so that everyone can see the dinosaur eggs, meet Lindsay, Lisa, and Aaron, and then we'll see you again next